it has been windy. Spring is definitely upon us. And the clips you guys just saw, because I'm going to put them at the beginning of this video, uh, this was two days ago, I think. The wind just completely blew our trampoline over. Don't worry. Before I know I'm going to get a comment. We did have it secured with both rebar that was bent over the bottoms and sand buckets and cinder blocks. <laughs> it was just a perfect storm. It ended up right here on the back porch and we were gonna leave it for a while uh, because I was like, well, it's securely put there. It, the wind's gonna keep going all day, might as well leave it. But then it ended up blowing over here to our septic hill, um, which is problematic because the wind was blowing that way. And our RV, which is currently rented out right now, was right there. So I was like, nope. So um, we, in the wind, took it apart. Um, and here is the trampoline. So we just took the net off in the field <laughs> um, while it was windy, just dismantled the net and then flipped this upside down and put a bu bunch of weights on it. That's fine. The net got kind of bent up in the process, obviously. <laughs> so that was probably toast anyways. And y'all, the winds are pretty bad here. Like just a straight wind tunnel down this ridge to our house. Um, so it may have been that it was never going to work anyways. And we're fine without the net to just have the trampoline up. It'll definitely be much more secure that way. But since it's been so windy and it's terrible to be outside, we're going to do something a little bit different. It's breezy today, but the wind's going to pick up. Uh, let me shut off the water. Look at me being a good composter and watering down my compost pile. So today we are just doing a quick little harvest of some cabbage because we are going to go inside and um, make a zesty coleslaw that I love to make here. And it's super simple, super easy, and it uses a lot of your winter crops. Um, that you may otherwise not have a use for or just have too many to harvest. It's a, this coleslaw that I make, it's just a great way to get rid of a ton of root vegetables and some cabbage and an egg. And my cabbage is looking so good. This stuff that I've left for a later harvest is starting to come to fruition. I'm not sure if this guy is the biggest one or this guy. And before we harvest, let me show you guys this real quick. Anyone who watched my last video um, knows about the aphids and the broccoli plant and I demonstrated how to get them off. Here's the broccoli plant now. <laughs> so this is the same broccoli plant that I got all of those aphids off the other day. And you can see it is completely infested again. Here's a lovely little bee. You can really see all of these aphids right here. But a major difference is this is a completely aphid invested crop and there are no aphids on this plant right here or on that one or on that one. So what I'm going to do at this point is leave the aphids on this single broccoli plant for one reason, and that is I am now considering this broccoli plant a trap crop. So a trap crop is gonna be any plant that tends to have bugs go to it versus other plants in the same vicinity. These can be things like um, a particular flower that a lot of bugs like, or even a single crop from a whole row just may be particularly infested with as some sort of pest. 
a lot of people will plant trap crops, flowers that certain bugs like, in order to try and keep those bugs away from their actual food crops. This is really common. I don't do it personally, but what I will do in the case of trap crops is leave like this little poor broccoli completely vulnerable to the aphids that apparently love it so much. Um, because they are only relegated to this plant and on none of my other broccoli um, plants. That means that they really, really want this crop and as long as they have it, they're not going to touch my other ones. Fingers crossed, hopefully. This would be a problem if this was my only broccoli plant that I wanted to save seeds from. That, that would definitely be a problem, <laughs> but it's not. And I have plenty of plants. They're all flowering and they're all very, very healthy. So I'm going to leave this to just get completely ravaged by aphids in the hopes that the aphids won't want to go to my other ones and destroy them. Now this may not always be the case and if, <laughs> and you'll just have to play it by ear, you know, observe what the bugs are doing, whether they're on anything else. Uh, if you decide to leave a plant as a trap crop, I absolutely love doing it. There's always like one tomato or one pepper plant that just gets eaten up by every single pest it could possibly get eaten up by and then the rest of my plants are healthy. I tend to leave that plant in the garden. Like it, just because it's turning ugly, because it's dying, I actually want to leave it in the garden so that the pests continue to stay at that plant because if I were to take out this broccoli plant, they're just gonna move on to another broccoli plant. And currently, while it's still there, they aren't touching the other ones. So I'm gonna leave it. <laughs> and it's kind of the same for this cabbage because I have a lot of aphids in here. Ugh, that's so gross. <laughs> but anyways, I was saying this cabbage has a ton of aphids, even on the inner leaves in here, while these are relatively untouched. I've got some aphids down here got some in here but the heads themselves are relatively untouched so I'm gonna leave this guy to just get completely eaten by aphids hopefully the rest will be left alone so that was just a quick word on the aphid problem because I told you guys last video the easy way to remove them is just spray them off with water um, and now that I've discovered it's basically a trap crop, I'm not going to do that anymore and I want to let you guys know. I am going to let that broccoli plant be completely decimated by aphids and um, hopefully the rest will be saved. And that is the idea of using a trap crop. So let's harvest a cabbage. Yeah, just one, probably just one cabbage and one rutabaga. Um, normally I'd be harvesting more root vegetables like carrots and beets and um, radishes for this coleslaw, but I already harvested all of them with you guys. So today we're just getting a cabbage and a rutabaga out of the garden. There's still a few aphids on here. It's just not quite as bad as this other cabbage. But I can rinse these guys off and we'll be good to go. Well, it's starting to sprinkle, which is both a blessing and a curse, but we're almost done. And then we're gonna head inside and make this coleslaw. <laughs> Shit, falling from the sky. <laughs> I'm gonna make some zesty coleslaw. I needed a rutabaga. Whew, I had to come inside real quick <laughs> because it started coming down. It's only gonna be raining for about five minutes. My lens is all wet. Anyways, I wanted to show you guys. I am going to soak um, these vegetables in a slightly vinegar, sli 
slightly vinegary water solution uh, because I've got some little friends along for the ride. <laughs> I don't know if you can see these guys. I've got a little hidey hole of roly polies, which is to be expected. This rutabaga was started in the fall. <laughs> So as you can see, it's really um, gnarly and hard. Not super hard, but it's definitely weather worn on the outside here on the top. Totally fine. The great thing about rutabagas, I love rutabagas because you can just grow them and then basically store them in the ground all winter, much like you can carrots. Uh, just the top part that's exposed to air will get hard. You'll have to peel this part. I guess you don't have to. You could just eat it as is. Um, but also the tops may get a little pithy as they age, uh, like cardboardy. So I'll probably only end up using this part of the rutabaga. Um, I just don't know how much this little hidey hole goes down into the food. <laughs> there's, there's like, I can see four roly polies right now. Um, so I'm gonna soak both the cabbage and the rutabaga in some vinegar water to make sure all the bugs are out, etc., etc., And then I don't know if I'm gonna get to making the coleslaw right this second. So there may be a costume change <laughs> before we make the coleslaw, but uh, that will be my prep, is the soaking of the vegetables beforehand because they are fresh from the garden, just to make sure I don't have any roly-poly guts in my coleslaw when we're done. <laughs> Hey guys, it is the next morning. I did not get around to making that coleslaw yesterday, but we are gonna start on this right now. And I'm going to walk you through it the best that I can. Um, I don't really follow recipes, and this one is one that I formulated from a different one and made it my own. It's a complete Frankenstein of the original recipe, but I'm going to list all of the ingredients down below. I don't have a whole lot of measurements for you, um, but we'll just take it as we go. <laughs> so I've got all my vegetables here that I'm going to use. As I said before, this is sort of amalgamation of winter root crops that you could be growing, or if you already are growing, that you can all use at once. So what I've got here are some carrots, a cabbage, a rutabaga, and one daikon radish, although I have used both daikon radishes and um, like Easter egg radishes, little the little red ones. The radish um, is really good in this coleslaw because it's a zesty coleslaw, it's got some spice to it. So using any sort of radish I found with some sort of bite really enhances the flavor um, of this coleslaw, which is its goal. It's it's not supposed to be a sweet coleslaw, it's supposed to be a, a spicy-ish coleslaw. We're gonna start out with cutting up all of these veggies. <laughs> um, Normally I would grate these, so I would chop the cabbage into relatively small strips like a normal coleslaw, and then I would grate the carrots and the radishes and the rutabaga. <laughs> but I remember this morning that our cheese grater broke, and we currently don't have one. <laughs> so I've got to chop all of these vegetables, because um, I'm, I'm, I didn't want to run to the store before this video just so I could have the ease of grating vegetables. But what I'll do is I'm just gonna chop all of these. I'll probably julienne them, really thin strips. It's not gonna be as thin as a grater would get it, but it'll have to make do. And that's fine, it's good practice um, to not have tools around and you have to do things by hand. So it won't take too long and surely I will skip through most of it for you guys. Can you see hi? Can you see hi? I usually don't make kitchen videos for several reasons. Um, first, the kitchen is not, my square kitchen is not very conducive to making videos. There's not a whole place, a whole lot of places to put my camera stand or my camera. Um, and then the lighting is poor. So, makes it difficult for me to give a good quality video in my kitchen. And then secondly, which you guys will see today, I don't really follow a whole lot of recipes. I'm actually pretty bad at following recipes. I don't have the patience to measure things out um, exactly the way they should be. Um, I don't wanna, most of the time I don't wanna drive to the grocery store for that one missing ingredient that the recipe calls for. 
So I end up taking a lot of recipes that I find and just making them my own on the fly, which can sound really daunting to someone who doesn't cook very often. I completely understand that. I, I have not been cooking from scratch for very long. Um, I would probably say my food preparation journey started in college. Um, I was vegan for two years, so I did a lot of my own food prep. And then um, I was really into fitness. I've done a lot of different, you know, fitness diets that require a lot of just cooking at home. So it, it was the work of several years of just gradually learning more and more about cooking that got me to where I am now in the confidence that I can just make something up as I go and it will more or less work out. And I don't necessarily think that you need to have years and years of cooking to be able to make recipes up or modify recipes. Um, it does take a certain amount of skill in the kitchen, you know, if, if you've never cooked from scratch and only cooked prepared meals, um, there can be a learning curve, definitely. Um, but most of all, it just takes the willingness to try something new. There's a lot of stuff I still don't know about cooking, because there's a lot of stuff I don't cook. I don't often cook with dairy, but it just takes a willingness to, you know, modify ingredients in a recipe and try it out. I wouldn't suggest, you know, trying out new things with really expensive ingredients like a Wagyu steak, <laughs> but um, you can definitely take a recipe and just substitute out one thing for that recipe and see how it works out. And then next time you can do a little bit more and a little bit more. And, and once you learn enough about the basics of cooking, um, making up your own recipes and, and modifying recipes gets really easy. You know, just the simple skill of knowing how to make a loaf of bread from scratch can translate to a ton of other different bread products just because you know the basics of how yeast and water and salt and sugar work. I mean, it's it's really all a, a downhill slope once you get started on it, and that's super easy and super fun. I think growing your own food also, you know, forces some sort of learning to happen uh, because once you start growing a significant amount of your own food you're left with a ton of produce that you need to find something to do with <laughs> and hopefully you do from the hours and money and time and resources that you put into growing all of your crops you don't want any of it to go to waste so over these last three years of being on this homestead and growing a significant portion of food i've learned exponentially more than I did in the previous decade, just, you know, cooking a vegan diet or cooking for health or weight loss. It's sort of like crash course in from scratch cooking. <laughs> all right, so we've got all the ingredients chopped up as good as I feel like doing it this morning. And we're just gonna mix this, make sure all of the carrots and radish pieces and rutabaga is incorporated evenly. I'm actually not that bummed about these piece sizes. Um, one of my biggest pet peeves is like soggy coleslaw, <laughs> which happens, which can happen really easily if you work the cabbage a lot um, because cabbage bruises and it'll release its juices if you squish and mess with it a bunch. So the chunkier pieces help avoid that as well as just not messing with this a whole bunch when you, once you're done cutting it. Um, we will get in there one more time when we're putting the sauce, the coleslaw mayo over it. But other than that, I do not want to bruise that cabbage a whole bunch, release a lot of the juices because I don't like soggy, slimy cabbage. <laughs> All right, so next up we've got the sauce for the coleslaw, the mayo essentially. But what I do, I do make my mayo from scratch with my own egg and oil. But I will add things to the mayo um, to make it a little bit more flavorful. We're doing garlic, uh, dash of vinegar, Dijon mustard, and then salt and pepper to taste. And then I like to make my mayo a little bit more runny. So if y'all have ever made mayo before, the general recipe is one whole egg to one cup of oil. 
and that should come out with a standard pretty stiff mayo. If you want it a little bit runnier, more like an aioli, then you're just gonna add less oil. It won't emulsify as much. So that's what I do, I add a little bit less oil. Not to mention, an entire cup of oil when you're buying high quality oils can get really expensive, especially for the amount of mayo it produces and how long it lasts. And although I do love making my own home mayo, um, we don't use a lot of it here in the house. We don't make a whole lot of sandwiches unless the kids are here. And because obviously there's no preser preservatives in my homemade mayo, it doesn't last that long in the fridge. So I tend not to make it that often unless I'm gonna use it within a day or two because it's just a ton of oil <laughs> that goes into this for it to go bad in less than a week in the fridge. But for this recipe, we're gonna make the exact amount that we need for the coleslaw. It'll be great, it'll get rid of one egg, and it's gonna be delicious. So we're going to start out by cracking the egg into whatever vessel you're gonna use to blend this up. You do not have to use an immersion blender like I have one here. You can use a regular blender. You can even beat the egg by hand and then um, emulsify it with the oil slowly, although that's a lot more work. And I have an immersion blender, so that's what I'm using. Um, for the classic mayo taste, if y'all are interested in just making homemade mayo, I found that adding the Dijon mustard, for whatever reason, is key in getting that mayo flavor, as well as using a neutral oil. Um, if you are opposed to using seed oils, which I very much understand, uh, I would recommend avocado oil over olive oil, just because the flavor difference is huge and you can definitely taste the olive oil when you make mayo with olive oil. So I'd recommend avocado oil, otherwise you can use any neutral flavored kitchen oil. Now first and foremost, you do want to emulsify this egg with the other ingredients before you start adding the oil. That is key here to make sure that you are getting the slow amount of oil you drip into after this to begin the emulsification process. Now you do want to add this oil slowly. Um, to let it slowly emulsify. A lot of people will say put in, you know, just a teaspoon at first or just slowly dribble it in the top. And that is what I do. But I have also seen successful videos where they will just put all of the oil on top of the immersion blender and then slowly it will work in um, over time if you keep the immersion blender pinned at the bottom of your vessel. I've seen it done both ways, and I am never one to say that there is only one way to do a thing. So just try it out, figure it out for yourself with whatever equipment you have. I promise it is a very easy process once you've done it a couple of times. And about here, I have found the consistency that I want specifically for this coleslaw. Okay, so as you can see, this consistency is a bit watery, um, but the flavor is perfect. That's exactly what I want, and that's about as much as I need. So like I said, I like, for this recipe, I won't make like a full mayonnaise that's super chunky. I would probably need to double the amount of oil that I actually put in here to make it a thick, like, type of viscous mayonnaise. This is fine, it tastes a bit like a garlic aioli, which is exactly what I'm going for. Um, so I probably used about half a cup of oil per one egg. And like I said, this is technically mayo, it's just really run runny, you would need more oil <laughs> to make it less runny. So we're just gonna put this mayo in. Look at that. Looks like coleslaw, because that's exactly what we're making. All right, now for the additional spices on top. So I did write the recipe down, kind of, <laughs> before I made this video. As you can see, there are no um, measurements on here, except for the mayo. <laughs> but uh, a couple of additional spices I always add are going to be salt and pepper to taste. Um, I don't necessarily like it salty, but I do not want it tasting sweet, so I do add Additional salt on top of what I put in the mayo and then additional pepper as well as I add this homemade chili powder that I have um, I just 
dehydrate a lot of my peppers that I grow from the previous year. I will save them in our dry food storage and then, you know, pulverize them as needed for more spice. So a hefty amount of this goes into the coleslaw. You can use any chili pepper you like or no chili pepper at all if you don't want it to be spicy. I'm also gonna do a splash of vinegar. Usually it's apple cider vinegar. I have this delicious peach vinegar I found at Sprouts. It's pretty cool. <laughs> I wouldn't buy it regularly, uh, but I'm just gonna use this instead. I'm not worried about the flavor. I'm not going for the actual taste of apple cider or peach vinegar, but I want that acid to be in the food. This is an extremely important ingredient that I cannot replicate for you guys. This is, this is juice from a jar of pickled jalapenos that I kept in the fridge over the winter. So last year, my last batch of Jalafuego peppers, I just chopped them up and pickled them, uh, like quick pickle, and I didn't even can them. Quick pickled them, put them in the fridge. They lasted me all winter long, and once the jalapenos were gone, I kept the juice because this is a key ingredient in the coleslaw. <laughs> so I would say if you needed an ingredient, go to the store and get pickled jalapenos, or if you have pickled jalapenos, use that. But the this specifically is, is so important in this coleslaw. So pickled jalapeno juice is another addition to the end if you wanted to add that in. And finally, we're gonna have to go grocery shopping in the indoor garden to get my last ingredient. We need cilantro. Ooh, there it is. Hey, look at all these plants. One final ingredient I will sometimes add to the slaw, and it's it's only a sometimes based on if I feel like it at the moment, <laughs> and I don't feel like doing it right now, but I add a diced onion. So I've used red, I've used yellow, and I've used white, and they're all delicious. They all add their different notes to the coleslaw, but adding just a little bit of that diced raw onion into the slaw gives it that, that little something of a bite to the arty delicious zesty coleslaw but let me put you guys on a time lapse and we will get the rest of these ingredients in and then be done final finished zesty coleslaw. So I have noticed that this tastes exponentially better if you just cover it, like right after you make it, cover it with, you know, whatever you want, beeswax, a top, plastic wrap, aluminum foil, who cares, and stick it in the fridge and give it like an hour for these flavors to blend together. And then like it's it's solidified the the, actual flavor of the entire coleslaw solidified after it's had some time to meld. But that is it guys. My little harvest to table <laughs> winter vegetable recipe. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry. It's so hard to follow. As you saw, I just keep adding ingredients to taste like until I feel like I get it right. That's why it's so hard for me to do recipes with y'all because I would have to sit here and like pour a little vinegar, mix it, taste it, pour a little bit more, measuring each amount just to get actual measurements for you guys. I don't, I don't wanna do that, <laughs> I'm sorry. But I hope you found this interesting and I hope you all found a, a good use for those extra root vegetables you might have. I know I did. I am so happy to have discovered this recipe just from the sheer volume of 
carrots and radishes I got this year. It was a great way to make use of the food I grew without just having it go to waste. Well, thank you guys for joining me this morning. I will have outside content soon enough. It is almost time to plant out all of my summer crops. I'm so excited. <laughs> I will catch you on the next one.